Good morning and welcome to Exeter Vineyard Church. My name is Clive. And my name's Celia. And we're really hope, happy that you're going to be with us this morning. Today we're going to start with some sung worship to help us focus on God. And after that, Dave and Sarah will give us an update on what's been happening in the church this week. Dave will then start off our new series looking at the book of Ephesians in the Bible. Finally, we'll have an opportunity to reflect on what we've heard. So why don't we kick off with some encouragement from the Bible and Celia's going to read Psalm 121 to us. I, I look, I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. Father God, we want to thank you so much for the encouragement that we see and hear in your word. Amen.
groups for week commencing 18th of April. So please remember as always to pray for cross lines and there's been, uh, you know, give us an update on that. So about two weeks ago, those, there was 30 residents, about half the people we were feeding were housed in a hotel throughout the last entire year pandemic. They've been moved on, uh, some of which they still access cross lines for food. So we're seeing more people in person than we were before, even though we're feeding less people, which means we're having more opportunities to pray for people and, and kind of chat to them about their lives and stuff. So that's really great. So there's something to be praying for anyway. Yeah, so continue to pray for that. Also, the work Roundabout are doing with struggling families and the refugee house with the family that are here and their preparation for the family that's coming. Mm. And last week, last Saturday, um, we had some youth uh, on a Zoom call playing games together and I think this is them saying hi now. <laughs> uh. So that's the youth saying hello and also my daughter having a little dig at me as well, <laughs> which is par for the course. Um, we have just finished uh, the first quarter of the year. We were looking at the spiritual practice of meditation. It was something we wanted to explore, try, really want people to continue. It's such a valuable practice. And to help us do that on the website in the news section is a page of shared wisdom. People have written in with things that they found helped them for meditation. So you can have a look at that and just you know give you some inspiration to try some stuff out yourself. And we're about to start a new spiritual practice which we're calling Digging for Gems and there's some information as well on the website on the news section. So if you want a reminder of how to do it, you can look there. We are also getting made some bookmarks that you can put in your Bible and it just has the kind of steps and rules to do this practice. The whole practice is about just getting meaning from the text, you know, like really getting to grips with what it's saying. And some people have been kind of getting in touch saying, I'm just not really sure what we're doing. I'm not sure why I would uh, not use certain words. I said, don't use any religious jargon or something. So what we want to do really quickly before we go into the, the talk for today is give an example. So I did it this week for the first 14 verses of Ephesians. I used uh, this Bible to do it from. Um, any kind of modern translation works. So say so you read out the first two verses and then I'll, I'll read out what I wrote. Okay. From Paul, appointed by God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus to the saints who are faithful to Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. So the, the whole point is to kind of unpack. That would be really easy just to skip over. But actually, even in that, there's a lot of meaning. So I wrote this much to do that i just read it out to you so I, i'm thinking there there's words like apostle saints grace and peace faithful these are all kind of religious words that we tend to think yeah i kind of know what that means but we don't get the meaning so this is what i wrote this letter comes from paul god has given me this job to be sent out by jesus to catalyze god projects in different places i write to god's people people transformed from normal existence into a wonderful new powerful and eternal life one that revolves around jesus our mighty rescuer this is i'm not this is just for me because this just expands the meaning for me this is why we do it for ourselves. i'm a little bit embarrassed reading it out now as i do it but um, and since this is true i proclaim upon you the wonderful favor of god undeserved unexpected and unfathomable to receive his love and kindness through no merit of our own but only because of what jesus chose to do for us and with this undeserved goodness comes peace a calm stillness that allows us to be content and centered no matter the situation all this and more comes to us because god has taken us as his children he is now our loving father and expresses this love with such wonderful gifts and jesus has become our lord and what a benevolent lord he is always showering us with good things for our benefit so it's just this idea that you get a chance to be kind of express and flow and be creative and have fun unpacking the meaning. So I really encourage you to try it. Like I said, it's quite involved. I did 14 verses. I think it took me about an hour, but I did it in three, three goes. So it's just if you can set aside 20 minutes, half an hour to do a block of, you know, five verses, uh, I'm really confident you will get stuff out of it. So it's something to try, but it does take a little bit of time and intention. Mm -hmm. yeah so we're going to finish <laughs> by praying <laughs> we're going to finish by praying the bride and body prayer 
Loving God, you're making us into your bride and your body. Help us live in your love and work for your glory. We pray all the things we do would bring fruit for your kingdom. Amen. It is such a beautiful day today that I had to do this outside, but it is still really cold. And uh, it just strikes me at the moment, isn't it? Isn't that our desire? We all want it to be the summer. We all want to put shorts and t-shirt on, but it isn't quite there yet. And it might look when you're like from a distance looking out at a house, it looks like it's going to be a beautiful day and it's still bitterly cold when you get outside. And actually, the passage we're looking at today is a little bit like that because it's talking about some of these amazing, wonderful realities about God. And But when we look around us and we look inside us, we think, well, this is not the reality at all. You know, there's this disconnect. And um, I think actually this is a major aspect of, of understanding Christianity is the fact that we can have these two things simultaneously, that the kingdom now and the kingdom not yet, this this idea that these amazing things have happened, but they're not quite happened yet. And I guess a way of understanding it might be to think about, imagine you were given a poison and it's killing you and you're in a coma and someone injects you with the antidote. Well, now you are no longer going to die. You know, you have been saved, but it will take time for that antidote to work its way through your system and you to fully recover and to, to discover the fullness of that life that you have. And I think maybe that's a little bit like what we see in the Bible. And that's a bit like what God is doing now. You know, the, the project of the church is to be the antidote going out into the world and taking the, the, the life-giving truth, the life-giving good news to people who are dying. And this kind of connects us again with Paul, who starts this letter by talking about that's his role to go out and, and give the antidote into different places, to start churches, to, to work through the system. So let's hear these first 14 verses. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms, because we are united with Christ. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do and it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace that he's poured out on us who belong to his dear son. And he is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of the Son and forgave our sins. He has showered his kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. God has now revealed to us his mysterious will regarding Christ, which is to fulfil his own good plan. And this is the plan. At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. Furthermore, because we are united in Christ, we have received an inheritance from God, for he chose us in advance, and he makes everything work out according to his plan. God's purpose is that the Jews, who were the first to trust in Christ, would bring praise and glory to God. And now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so that we would praise and glorify him. So that was the first 14 verses of Ephesians. And I don't know how you felt about that, wonderfully read though it was, but for me, this is classic Bible blur territory. You know, as I read it, my eyes glaze over and it just feels foggy in my brain because there are lots of impressive sounding religious terms and phrases, but I can't really capture the meaning. It's all coming at me too fast and too densely. And so in the end, out of the fog, I just kind of resolve it to God is good and be nice. And part of the reason we are doing this 
spiritual practice of digging for gems is it slows us down and it forces us to unpack all the meaning and, uh, and see what we get out of it. So as I rewrote this, I picked up this theme that I want to talk about today that actually I didn't really notice when I read it. But as I rewrote it, I, I picked up the idea of the heavenly and the earthly coming out in these 14 verses. Now, I know that in the Bible, heavens and earth aren't about geography. You know, we tend to think of heavens as up there and earth down here, but they are more about who's in that space. So the heavens is where God dwells. So the heavens are all about eternal, pure, wonderful, amazing, life-giving stuff. Whereas the earth is the place that turned our back on God, that decided to go our own way. So it's a place of rebellion, of absence of God. It's messy up, messed up and broken with all the consequences and shame that comes from that. And so these two ideas are what the Bible is talking about, which is why when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we say, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This idea of the eternal, of the God stuff coming in to our earth, to our world. And it's the intention of God. His plan is in the age to come, not that we get whisked out of this horrible, messed up world, but that heaven, that we get remade so that heaven can come and dwell here with us on the earth. So we don't spend eternity as disembodied spirits floating on a cloud, but what we do is we get to live in a wonderful world with all this physical stuff, the clouds, the trees, the grass, the animals, industry, creativity, all that stuff, but perfect, not messed up at all. So um, I was rewriting it, thinking about those things. So let me read what I wrote for verse three and verse nine and 10. So verse three is this, God is happy. He is so pleased to shower us with his overflowing happiness. Every good thing in the universe, every truly good and eternal thing, the things of the Garden of Eden and of heaven and of the age to come are ours. We find them in Jesus. And then later in verses 9 and 10, I wrote this. We can now see this plan unfolding. A universe broken by rebellion is now being restored. All elements, the perfect, infinite, heavenly pieces, as well as the broken, messy and rebellious earthly pieces are coming together with Jesus as the Lord, with him in charge. And it was as part of this plan, this restoring all the broken and messed up universe and coming together with the perfect heavens, that you and I were chosen. This whole thing involves us. So I want to talk today about this idea of these two things, the, the heavens and the perfect heavens and the messed up earth coming together when God doing that and, um, and how the perfect heavens might saturate and change the messed up earth. And the way I want to talk about it is from my personal experience. And so I want to talk about a struggle I've had. Now I've talked about this in church before but uh, not for a long time, so you might not have heard it. And also, usually when we do this in a Sunday service, the kids would be out. So I would be talking to adults about an adult themed subject because I want to talk about my struggle with lust. And so I'm going to be circumspect with my language and uh, yeah, just to do that. So hopefully it will go over their heads if necessary. But from a teenager, this was something I would struggle with, this kind of like urge and desire in me, which I understand is totally natural, but it was something that I never really wanted. And it wasn't just a shame from a conservative upbringing because I didn't have a conservative upbringing. It was an element of myself that I didn't like. And most importantly, I didn't feel I controlled. I felt it controlled me. I would cope with it, by managing it. So I would, by force of will, have periods where I would be on top of it and then I would mess up. And it never went away. All I was doing was managing it. And I have a memory of, you know, and this is a long time ago, of having to stay away, staying on my own in a hotel room and being aware as I went to bed that there was a TV in there that if I turned it on late at night on a certain channel, I would probably see something that I didn't want to see, but I also totally wanted to see. And I remember this kind of churning and the stress of it meant I really struggled to sleep that night. And 
that picture, that metaphor of me trapped like that is, uh, is a really good one, I think. That, that feeling of there's this part of me that I don't like, but it is, it's running the show, really, and I wish it wasn't. And my big hope was that I would be zapped. This is kind of the, the, ch the stories I'd heard in church of people who struggle with stuff that the Holy Spirit would just come and bam, zap them. There would be some visiting speaker with an impressive uh, testimony. He would come and he would pray over me and it would just gone. That part of me would be removed. And that's what I wanted. I wanted it to happen with as little fuss as possible. Because the other thing was, I was really concerned about my reputation. I was ashamed of this. So it was all about being secret and pretending it wasn't there and trying to cover it up and trying to uh, manage it so that other people didn't know about it. And which is interesting. Another theme of those 14 verses in Ephesians is that just God, God is so in charge. He knows everything. He's running a plan. He, his intention is running everything. And so there's no point pretending that he doesn't know stuff, but that's what was happening. I wasn't just hiding from other people. I was hiding from God as well. So that picture of me in a hotel room just absolutely churned up because I know that there's in the corner room, there's this thing that I could do and it would you know, mess me up and I'd feel really guilty about it, all that. I think that's a good metaphorical picture for the, my situation, just feeling trapped by this thing that I didn't want. And then about 20 years ago, God started a process in me which I think kind of is this, is what this Ephesians is talking about, when heaven kind of invades and transforms the world, when it's brought together under Jesus. And it started with me being honest with myself, being honest with good and with God, and being honest with others, not everyone, not like shouting it out, but with select others and, and telling Sarah and being real about this. This was at the start of our marriage. It was a problem I had naively thought would just go once I got married and it didn't. And so absolute honesty and acceptance that I just wasn't the person that I wanted to be. And, and you know, and just be, being free to be able to say that instead of trying to always manufacture the person I thought I should be. Just, I, I am like this and I don't want to be like this. God help. And so God started to work and it was really this this Jesus coming into that part of my life and changing it that happened. I wanted to be zapped. I just wanted the thing to be removed. But actually what happened is I started to learn about myself. I started to learn about God. I started to learn about the consequences of what I was doing. I started to learn that the problem wasn't the outworking, but the problem was deeper. It was in my heart. It was in my soul. It was in my motivations. It was in even things that seem unconnected. It was in how I coped with stress and boredom and feeling overwhelmed. All these things were playing into this. And I started to learn about that. And I can remember at this time, there was, uh, I would sometimes watch TV adverts for bank accounts or toothpaste. And I knew that advert had been designed to appeal to that part of myself that I hated. And I couldn't watch them. I was so sensitive to it. And uh, I mean, that is how adverts work. They appeal to those, those aspects of us. But I had become so sensitive because God was at work in me. But I was being changed and set free. I was seeing God come and work. And where, while I just wanted something completely removed, what God did was transform me. You see, I think sin, living with sin in secrecy and shame had hardened my heart had turned my heart to stone. And what God came and did was bring it back to life. And through a process, my heart started to soften. And that was painful at times. That was when I was so sensitive to stuff and I just felt that I needed God so much at all times. And I felt like a little baby, you know, trying to cope with this. I felt I had no resources of my own. But he was turning my heart into bringing it back to life. And when my desires didn't go, but they were different and they no longer controlled me. But in the process of softening my heart, I discovered all these other wonderful things of heaven that started to spring up in my life. I discovered, like I, I became much more compassionate. I became much more patient. I became much more wise. I became much more humble 
all these other things that were not nothing to do with me but kind of was God showering his goodness into my life because he was bringing heaven and the perfect heaven and the messed up of my life together and doing amazing things and this is what God does you know we talk about the five securities I think we see here so we can be secure in faith we can be secure that God just absolutely loves us I didn't even like myself for much of that but God always loved me we can be secure in the good news. It always felt so risky to just, instead of trying to manage and control this area of my life, to be vulnerable and open and surrender it and invite God in. It felt so risky that it could have been bad news, but it was good news because God always writes good news. And it's about being secure in our everyday life. It's very easy to think, well, actually all this stuff, it's not, it doesn't affect my church activity, so I can just ignore it. But God is interested in every aspect of our life. So as we wind up, is there something you're struggling with? This is my nudge and maybe it's your nudge. This is a gem I got that I want to share with you. Is there something that you are struggling with? Is there a part of your life that feels it has control over you? Is it your temper? Is it gossip? Is it shopping? Is it controlling situations? Is it fear? Is there something that if you're honest, it just, it just owns you? And you don't want it to? And is it time now? Is this the nudge from God to say to God, God, this is what I'm like. I don't like it. I don't want to be like it. I know you don't want me to be like it. Can you help me? Is it time to share it with someone else and say, I'm challenged about this area of my life. I want to work through it. I want to invite God in. Will you ask me about it? Will you ask how I'm doing? Is it a time to kind of examine our motivations and say, these are the things that send me into that, send me into gossip, send me into control, send me into shopping, send me into tempers. You know, how do I, how do I deal with a root cause, not just a symptom? All of these things is covered by Jesus. When it says he draws everything into himself, it includes this, includes all the mess in our lives. Jesus isn't put off. He doesn't, he doesn't hold his nose. He doesn't hope you'll sort it out before you come to him. This is why he came, so that all this mess can be sorted. And instead of the mess, you can get all this heavenly stuff. He's pure, energetic, full of life, life in the areas. So just to finish, years and years later, I was staying in a hotel room and it occurred to me that there was a TV in the corner of the room and it had those channels on and I could probably turn it on and see those and it had no power over me at all. And I was amazed. I was freer than I ever thought I could possibly be because God is so good and the work he does in us is so deep. So let us invite God in. Let us embrace this process that Ephesians talk about where he is bringing everything under him and offer him these areas of our lives. So God, this can be vulnerable, it can be embarrassing, it can be opening doors that we've tried to keep closed. But God, we know, and we really know that you know, there's stuff in our lives that needs to get sorted. And so Father, we just even need your strength to start this. Lord, where is it? Where are the, these issues that control us, that dominate us and stop us being as free and living the life? And Lord, we want to journey with you. We want to be set free. We want to discover what you want to do and what you're going to bring out of this as, as well. What other wonderful things you're going to shower on us. So I pray, God, I pray that you would help us. And we just thank you that this is what you do, that you bring good things out of mess. In Jesus' name, Amen. We're now going to have a moment to reflect on this theme and ask God to speak to us. So let's try to be still and open to what God might want to say. Holy Spirit, we invite you to speak to us now.
Thank you so much for joining with us this morning. We pray that you'll be blessed and be a blessing to others throughout the week. But if you need any help, do contact us on... On email, hello at exe.fin. So we'll say goodbye for now. Have a good week and be blessed. Bye-bye now. Bye.